So far, uh, we talked about different experimental techniques with which vacancy concentration, okay, formation energy, as well as the migration energy of uh, vacancies could be determined. Similarly, for interstitials also, we require that same information. Interstitials, what we require is only the concentration of the interstitials which are going to be there, okay, and their migration energy, okay. <coughs> because unless and until the self interstitials because most of the time interstitials are elements which are added as impurities to the sample okay so what all to get this information what we should know is that as i mentioned earlier like vacancies it's only removal of an atom from a lattice site whereas in the case of an interstitial what is essentially is going to happen is that there are many equivalent sites to which the interstitial can go and occupy. So what we should know is what is the site at which the interstitial is occupying. And as we had seen also that even if one interstitial is uh, self interstitial is uh, generated in a lattice, it moves an adjacent atom and occupies a position which does not correspond to an interstitial site which is dictated by crystallography, right. So it generates a distortion, okay. That also will have an effect on the mobility of this defect. Now it is something like a complex which it forms, okay. So just even if it occupies a position, uh, uh, interstitial position, uh, interstitial position in the material, the symmetry associated with that site itself will give a lot of information about how the interstitial is going to behave, okay. The other information which we required is the migration energy of the interstitial, okay. How can we get this uh, information, okay. Generally, we mentioned that the interstitial moves much faster compared to that of vacancies, okay. So that the jump rate, the rate at which interstitial jumps from one site to another site is very high. This can be measured using two types of experiments, okay. One is an experiment which is like a tensile test, okay. You apply some load and try to find out how in response to that load the strain as a function of time develops. That is an another type of an experiment which we can perform, okay. Generally this type of an experiment is extremely useful when the jump rate is small. That means that slowly it is taking place. The other type of an experiment is when the jump rate is rather very fast, okay. In that case the type of experiment which is being done is that instead of a static loading system, we can do a cyclic loading, okay. That type of an experiment is what we call it as an internal friction experiment. This is what another otherwise it is called as a torsion pendulum, okay. This can be used to get information about the migration energy as well as the concentration of interstitial defects which are present in the material, okay. These are all the, so before we go into uh, these experiments, let us just try to understand about the uh, relationship between the symmetry of the sites which are uh, mentioned where the interstitials can go, okay, and the distances at which adjacent atoms are there, are located with respect to the interstices, okay. If you look at uh, here, okay, this is a vacancy. We can have an octahedral as well as a tetrahedral sites, right. The same information we get it, this is from the relevant portion of the Wyckoff position table which is given in the International Union of Crystallography table I had given, ok. 
Okay. From this we can notice that there are once atoms occupy these positions corresponding to 4A, A position, Y cup position, the B Y cup position we can have four positions are there. Okay. That means that at the center or at the uh, face, uh, the corner uh, edge face uh, uh, middle. Okay. These are all the places where the impurity atom which is a small interstitial can come and occupy it. Okay. The distance from this position to all the adjacent positions where the atoms are there are equal, correct? So there is a symmetry which is being maintained and the same symmetry is reflected here also. It is M3 bar M, it is a cube symmetry. If you look here, the tetrahedral interstices which are there, okay. here also around each of this center of this, the atoms are with respect to interstitial impurity, atoms are uh, located at distance which are the same distance, right? So this also has got a symmetry which is a cubic symmetry. In fact, uh, we can see that there are other positions are like there where mirror symmetry is there. This symmetry position, uh, if these two are not possible, okay, or if these two positions in allowing some elements have occupied it, then maybe the next element which we add will come into this position or this will be the interstices where to which suppose we add a third element which are very fine, we, whose size is very small, they will try to occupy these positions. Okay. So essentially what is important here is that it is quite symmetric. In this, it, it does not matter, suppose I apply a load to this sample. Then what will happen? Take a sample, apply a load, which is essentially in the elastic region, then sample will get elongated, correct? So when that gets elongated, since it is a site is symmetric, all the sites are going to get elongated in the same way, correct? There is no asymmetry which is involved, this one. So same energy is spent on. Uh, irrespective of where that uh, interstice is, whether it is at the center or at this edge or this particular edge, it does not make any difference. Okay. But let us look at the case in BCC material. In a BCC material, what happens? Here, the six octahedral sites are there. In this particular case, if an interstitial atom is put here, okay, to this interstitial site, the distances if we consider it, the atoms on this face are at a distance a by root 2 and atoms at the top and the bottom are at a by 2. Okay. There is an asymmetry which is associated with it and you look at the site symmetry corresponding to this, this is essentially 4 by mmm, so it is like a tetragonal symmetry. Okay. And what are the other equivalent uh, sites which are there? These sites are one here okay, and another one here. So if an interstitial atom occupies this position, then this is the tetragonal uh, distortion which is going to be there. That is because in this the distance is A by 2 the direction which is perpendicular to it, the adjacent atoms are going to be at A by 4, correct? So the direction of here, the uh, distortion is along the C axis direction, okay, more. In this, the distortion is along the B axis direction. In this, the distortion is along the C axis direction, correct? So that is what essentially I had shown, marked it as A, B and C, the interstitial positions, three positions which I had shown with respect to a BCC unit cell. And similarly, if you look at the uh, tetrahedral sites also, okay, with respect to a position which interstitial occupies, all atoms are not at the same position. And if we look at the site symmetry corresponding to it, it also shows a tetragonal symmetry. Okay. Now let us take the case of octahedral one. As BCC material, we are adding some impurities. 
okay this could be carbon nitrogen or oxygen atoms which have got very small size they go to interstitial positions okay then we can make out that three distinct positions are there depending upon the a distortion which it will introduce correct that is one a position b position and c position because the strain which it, uh, if an interstitial comes here is going to be more in this direction compared to the directions which are perpendicular to this in this particular case what will happen by probability okay if you look at it any impurity which is added it has a possibility of occupying either a b or c position if we add n impurities okay interstitials are added n by 3 will occupy a type position n by 3 will occupy b type and n by 3 will occupy c type positions so now they are randomly distributed correct and each site will give rise to some uh, extension in the sample because some tetragonal strain which will introduce so overall the tetragonal strain which is introducing introduces each one of them is going to be the same in all the three directions so overall there is an expansion which we see it that sample correct there is no other change now the scenario will change suppose we add we apply a load like in this case if we apply a load then what's going to happen is that and this load which is applied is very small so it's an elastic distortion so the whole crystal is getting elongated in this direction the cubic one becomes slightly a tetragonal one right so when there is an increase in lattice parameter along this direction now an interstitial occupying which occupies this position the c position it finds that the energy which is required the strain is getting reduced so there is a gain in energy it's easy for that to occupy that position correct whereas in these two positions which is a and b type of a position in this since elongation is going to be there and in this direction there is a slight compression is going to be there if an atom tries to occupy that position okay the more energy is required to be there because lot of compression is coming in what it will try to do naturally it will try to jump out from that position and try to go into an another position but we know that the number of sites which are there are quite large all the three sites and the concentration of the defect is much small compared to that okay and we assume that there is not much of interaction between the defects that's the basis on which we are uh, talking about this experiment okay now an atom will try to jump from here to the uh, both from a site as well as b site will try to jump into the c site because only few c sites are being occupied by interstitials correct so that depends upon what is the rate how many c sites are now still available for a, interstitial atoms to jump from a and the b site correct and as they jump and try to occupy that site the number of sites available gets reduced so an expression which we will get it is the rate at which it's going to reach that site the number is going to be an exponential form of an relationship it will come okay so each site an interstitial atom is occupying okay that is going to generate delta m equals some constant into some stress it will locally introduce correct or if an atom jumps from from at this side to this side if it jumps okay the strain it is going to increase in that direction when an interstitial atom jumps that means that there is going to be an elongation which is going to occur and this process takes place 
as a function of time right. So, what we have done it is we have applied a load ok. When we apply a load what it will happen that is an elongation that is we take a sample a hook which is there I just put a load here very small load so that a very small increment in strain which is there introduced elastic strain. One should understand that one should distinguish it between the two types of experiments which we perform. In a conventional machine tensile test when we do how we, how do you do the test? It is you control the strain the rate at which you are pulling that sample. Here in this experiment what we are doing it is we are just applying the load so the strain is instantaneous. So, if you try to plot time versus the strain what is going to happen is that immediately corresponding to a load dictated by Hooke's law it will achieve that much of a strain. Once that has been reached all the in that direction the lattice has been elongated. Now, the interstitials which are occupying A and B positions will gradually try to jump into the C side position. Every time one of them jumps it will add to some increment in strain. So, that means that at that constant load as a function of time the strain is going on increasing. So, what will happen? We will be seeing that the strain gradually it is an exponential one it will and finally be reach when all the atoms have jumped ok then it reaches a maximum value. This is epsilon maximum we can tell. So, that epsilon maximum the difference between this is an instantaneous load instantaneous strain this difference is proportional to the concentration of the defects is it not. So, what is essentially happening is that after the load has been applied and the material has deformed to that extent the elongation has taken place now as a function of time there is an expansion of the sample which is going on this is called as the analastic deformation. Now, suppose we uh, remove the load then immediately it will reach some value ok. Corresponding to this value what is it going to happen? That corresponds to that uh, uh, is dictated by the uh, Hooke's law how much corresponding to the load when we remove it it will try to come back. Now, the lattice is being coming back to the original uh, cubic symmetry. Now, all sides are probable. So, atom preferentially occupying one side is uh, does not because it is going to be a strain which is going to be more. Now, it will try to jump to A as well as B sides. This will give rise to again an analastic deformation. and it will be trying to come like this right. This is the way the strain will look like general position means. But if any interstitial has to occupy a particular position it will require a very high energy. If any position which is available the symmetry and the uh, energy is related what is the energy which is required for that position to be occupied. Only if all other positions are occupied then it will prefer to go to that position ok. So, the delta n the number of defects which are jumping when the load is being applied that is proportional to ok n 0 into exponential minus t by 2 this sort of an expression which we can right we can write in. So, the total strain now equals for the same load normal 
tensile test, it is essentially stress is proportional to strain. Here not only that, after the stress has been applied, the strain takes some time for it to reach the maximum strain value. That means there is a lag which is taking place between the stress and the strain, some time difference which is happening. Okay? And the total strain equals the elastic part plus the anelastic part. Okay? If you look at how the anelastic part will come, okay? this delta E max depends upon delta N. So similar to this, we can write in another one expression correct for the strain itself. In any experiment which we perform tensile test experiment, we can immediately find out okay, from the nature of this plot, the torque can be determined, right? And generally this torque is related to the rate at which the atoms jump by this formula so, okay. This is the sort of relationship. This part of the derivation I am not going into. Okay, how these are related. This is related to atom jumping from one side to another. What is the value which is required is tau i jump rate. That is determined upon what the tau which we determine from this plot. This is, the, this is valid for all these experiments. Okay. The same thing we can consider it from an energetic point of view also. Okay. Here if you look at it, when in the absence of a stress, if an atom jumps from an A site to a B site, okay, it is going to reach a position which will have the same energy, right? Only thing is that it has to overcome an energy barrier. Suppose a load is being applied. Now how it modifies the energy barrier? Okay. Already the atom in the A site, okay, the strain is more. So it requires less energy to jump from that site to a C site. Okay. And if you look with respect to a potential which is from the C site, okay, under the application of the tensile load, if an uh, interstitial atom has to jump to the A site, the potential barrier which it has to overcome is actually it is Q plus U by 2, where U is essentially is the uh, energy corresponding to applied strain. Okay? So from this we can make out that probability wise, even under the application of the load, that is a probability that atom can jump from C site to A site or B site but from A site and B site also it can jump to this one. But there is a bias towards jumping from A and B towards C site is more compared to that of the one from C site to the other side. Okay. Using this information only, this derivation has been made. Okay. But that part of it I am just leaving it. But let us get along with this experiment. Okay. In this experiment, if you have to measure this uh, Analytic deformation, okay. Suppose it moves very fast. The jumping of the atom from A site and B site to a C site is occurring very from this site to this site occurs so fast. Takes a fraction of a millisecond. But what happens by the time we have applied the load, you find that that has also occurred. So the total strain as a function of time, we are not able to see it. If the jump rate is rather slow, takes minutes or uh, 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 hours, then we can see that gradually this sort of a change could be measured. Okay. Suppose jump rates are really fast, this experiment, uh, this sort of experiment will not give accurate information about the rate at which the atoms are jumping, for which the cyclic uh, deformation test is used, which is essentially nothing but a torsion pendulum. In a torsion pendulum, what is being done? A wire is taken of the sample. It is held rigidly at the top, okay, of some specific length. Then at the bottom, we have an inertial bar, okay, to which we can apply some uh, load also. 
then what you do it is we just twist the bar a little bit okay depending upon where we keep that load and twist it we can change the frequency with which we are trying the bar this is like a pendulum this pendulum will go on oscillating correct what will happen if we do this experiment in this room then since air is going to be there every time this pendulum moves like this that air gives a damping resistance because of which after some time it will come to zero and amplitude will get reduced to zero but at the same time when that amplitude is extremely small damping amplitude the frequency is not getting affected but the amplitude of this pendulum if you look at it it will start from here but with the same frequency it will just like this reach a zero value correct this we are t- uh, talking with respect to a damping externally suppose in the material itself there are some defects which are jumping from one to the other which is taking place this jump itself is if it is random that can generate a preferential jump which it takes place it can also produce a damping in the material this damping also will try to bring down the amplitude so if we can measure how this damping is uh, taking place look at this plot we can get some information about the migration energy this is what is done in this experiment okay now we'll talk about the details about this experiment okay let us consider a few cases one case is that i am doing this experiment the oscillation is being done with a frequency which is very fast okay if i do this experiment at a very fast frequency what happens is that the rate at which atoms are jumping is rather slow then it will not be able to follow this movement so it will behave like an ideal pendulum then how will the stress strain plot look at it uh, look like because it's going from one to other compression to tension it will be essentially nothing but a straight line correct this is how the plot will look like okay now we do an experiment in an other way where the uh frequency of the pendulum because the period with which we are doing it is so large that the pendulum is able to accommodate or the frequency with which the jump takes place is at a much faster rate compared to the oscillation frequency of the pendulum and in such a case okay that at every instant of time okay when we do this for applied stress the full analytic uh, deformation is also able to take care of it in such a case how will the stress strain plot look like corresponding to this one Do you have any idea no the stress is applied stress that remains so the strain increases so the plot will look like this now, right the slope of the plot will come down this is the way it will behave correct now let us see the case where the oscillation frequency and the jump frequency are close to each other okay in such a situation what we are going to face is essentially that a hysteresis loop will come okay it's not completely able to move it's trying to move in the direction so now it will look like a like fatigue test when we do we get a or a, get a hysteresis loop this type of a loop will take place okay that is during each part of this cycle okay there is a loss in energy okay in a pendulum in a normal hysteresis cycle especially in a uh, fatigue test how do we find out that half uh, amplitude of the stress into strain we can find out the energy here what it will happen what is the manifestation of the uh, hysteresis loss 
area under the curve, but in the experiment amplitude is getting reduced. Why the amplitude is coming down? If there is no resistance damping is there, it should move with the same amplitude, right? In a case where there, there is no damping, it should have been for an infinite time it should move like this. Now what is happening is that when since it is going to be there, this gradually gets reduced. For uh, any cyclic test, okay, how do you find out the intensity? Intensity is proportional to the area which you can take strain, A squared, correct? Yes? Hmm? It will happen, gradually it will happen. So essentially what I just wanted to show you is that it is a energy loss which is going to be there, okay. So this if we try to look at it, this is the way, okay. So the energy loss per cycle, okay, how we can generate it is that what is going to be the amplitude on each of this uh, occasion? If this is the amplitude, here is A1 and here is the amplitude A2, okay. Amplitude squared is uh, relation to the energy, okay. Then A2 squared minus A1 squared by A1 squared, this formula, okay. Then if we uh, do some simple algebra, we can find that this is twice delta A by A. What is delta A? is the difference between the amplitudes of successive cycle divided by the average amplitude. Okay. This is nothing but equal to the energy loss per cycle. This is how we can relate it, okay. And this same thing, if you look with respect to time what happens when the stress has reached a maximum, the strain has not reached a maximum, strain reaches a maximum after some time, correct. So in any electrical circuit, we say that when the voltage and the current, okay, when they are not in the same phase, we say that that's a lag which is there. Similar to that, here also we can denote it by a lag. Okay, how much is the lag which is going to take place? Okay, the an elastic part of the deformation. Yeah, an elastic part of it. Yeah. So the same thing which we are calling is a tan alpha. We can define exactly in the same way using the electrical circuit. We can this is how it is being defined. Okay. Okay. This I had just written the essential uh, value, and generally in electrical circuits, what we say that this is by a function delta we denote it. Okay, that is nothing but equal to uh, tan alpha pi into tan alpha. So what we are able to, when the rate at which the pendulum is moving, okay, if the frequency of amplitude of the pendulum what we are giving it turns out to be the same as the rate at which it is jumping from one side to the another side, okay. If the jump frequencies they match perfectly, then the delta will have the maximum value will come delta max, that is the lag will be maximum. So this lag itself is a measure and that depends upon how many of the defect concentration or the interstitial concentration is present. Okay. The experiment, what is it being done? We do not know what is the concentration of the defect. No. So what we do is that you keep at a particular temperature do this experiment at one frequency, okay. You find some delta value will come, lag, okay. Then you do it at another frequency. That means that the amplitude at which these are going to change, the ratio of the amplitudes is continuously going to change depending upon the frequency at a particular temperature, correct. And that is a measure of the delta also. Then if we just go on doing it for some time, it will reach a maximum value lag and again it will decrease. So if we plot this delta versus the applied frequency, okay, these are all the terms which are used, do not bother about that. 
we will be getting a plot like this right this plot is essentially so what we can find out is at a particular temperature to reach the maximum delta value okay what is the frequency uh, uh, the oscillation frequency of the pendulum now and this frequency can be related to directly to the jump rate also okay. so essentially what it will be that uh, this omega into this one equals delta equals 1 this is how the expression will be okay. i do uh, this experiment at another temperature just varying this frequency then what will happen the frequency at which the maximum of delta occurs oscillation frequency external oscillation frequency which you are imposing on the crystal that will be different on the sample so not only that so delta is a concentration okay delta and omega at maximum delta max depends upon the relaxation time too okay these are all the two factors which we get it now if we do this experiment at different temperatures this is the sort of a plot which will be getting it and this delta is called as the internal friction coefficient okay that represents the internal friction so the maximum value at each temperature for different that is frequencies are going to change in this particular type of experiment what they have done is they have done it in a different way because it's a data can be collected by doing experiment in a different choosing a different matrix format what they have done they have kept the frequency constant okay and then just change the temperature okay at each temperature you find out how the amplitude is varying then do at another frequency just vary the uh, temperature okay whichever way we do it it's a matrix which we are generating with respect to frequency and temperature and trying to have this plot from this plot what we can get it is the frequency which we are corresponds to frequency of oscillation with which we are able to find out when the delta max that is the internal friction coefficient become maximum that corresponds to the jump rate okay we know that the jump rate is corresponding to inverse of temperature so if you try to plot okay the log of tau versus 1 by t the slope of this line will get information about the migration energy correct in this the defect concentration is already decided which is already has been added to the sample correct so essentially what this relationship depends upon is only on the migration correct okay but in this experiment what is it which is very important about this experiment is that how exactly this experiment is done in the pendulum which is there at the end of it we attach a mirror okay this is the mirror which is attached when the pendulum moves this mirror also moves okay with the same oscillation it moves what is being done is that you have a torch light uh, not torch light a laser beam which is falling onto the pendulum and at its moves it will be deflected okay you have you can have a position sensitive detector and collect this oscillation and since it's kept at a distance okay it's magnified information which we get it so that this amplitude variation could be measured very sensitively that is what is very important to get accurate information correct that is what essentially is being done so with this experiment 
what we are able to do is that we can measure the migration energy for different types of interstitials which we can get it. Okay. This is what the value which is being given for one mold here. Okay. This is around the 74.1 kilocalorie. Okay. Another is uh, for vanadium in which carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, different elements it has been determined. Okay. Not only that, since we are talking about uh, uh, defects movement, okay, even on substitutional impurities the same thing could be done. Only thing is that the uh, jump rates will be at a higher temperature, correct. So, this experiment could be performed for interstitial or substitutional impurities we can find out. And another is that suppose a self interstitial is there. The self interstitial when it occupies a position, it is not occupying the position which is dictated by the uh, crystallographic uh, or the geometrical crystallography. Okay. It occupies a position like for example, in a simple cubic line 100 phase if you look at it okay. or in an FCC if it is going to be there. This is how the 100 phase the atoms are looking like. If you add an interstitial, it will be coming to this position. So, essentially what it does it is that since the position of atoms are quite close by, now it takes a position where right, when this sort of a position which occupies, if you look at the adjacent atoms, they are not all at the same distance, correct? So, it has changed a distortion which it has introduced. Now, this itself we are looking at one, what all the possibilities with respect to other phase it could be, it could take place with respect to this direction. There are many three possibilities which exist, correct? So, essentially when this defect has to move, it can something like this, can move like this, like this, like this, like this, it can move. It will have a different way in which it will be moving, correct? Coupled yeah, coupled movement. Then similarly, if you have a uh, not only single interstitial, suppose it is a complex which is moving, then it will have a different jump rates. So, by doing this experiment, we can identify not, if you know that not only the way the defect is, from the looking at the migration energy, we can get some information about indirect information, the structure of the defect configuration itself. Okay. What is the basic problem essentially which is being seen? This is a very nice simple experiment, but you find that this experiment is uh, hardly only very few places this sort of setup and the setup is very simple to do, correct? It does not take much of a uh, uh, time or uh, energy to set up. What is important is that the room when we do the experiment should not be there. Even a small vibration then you will not be able to get the measurements. That is the precaution which has to be taken in doing this experiment. Otherwise it is a very neat very accurate method with which we can find out both the concentration as well as the migration energy. Okay. So, now if we look back what we have done, we have these are all the things if we summarize the last four lectures, we have looked at the point defects starting from the different type of defects which can be present, okay. the defects in metallic ordered alloys as well as in uh, ionic materials. Okay. Then what is the type of a theoretical calculation or equation which is uh, available for finding out the equilibrium concentration of vacancies. Okay. Then what are the experimental techniques which are available and their relative merits and demerits also with which we can get information about the concentration of the defects, their formation energy as well as this migration energy. Okay. So, basic information which is both experimental as well as theoretical information 
which is necessary to characterize point defects we have covered in this last four lectures. Now, we will go from here to talk about that other type of defects like dislocations we will start. Okay. Before that some basic information which is necessary regarding stress and strain okay. and uh, the nature of stress and strain. Okay. These aspects we will start discussing in the next few classes. Okay. We will stop here now. Anyway, I will give some assignments also. By working out that assignments, one will get much better idea uh, uh, about this topic. Okay.